This morning we're going to talk about what happens when things go wrong. As my friend Eric Kabelski likes to say, what could possibly go wrong? Isn't that the name, name of your life or mine? What could possibly go wrong? Things do. And isn't it good to know that God has a plan for us when we hit those either bumps in the road or those major catastrophes where it seems like our whole world's unraveling. And so we're going to go to Psalm 46 today. I ask if you would stand with me. And I'd like us to read this aloud together. If you can see the words up there. And we'll, we'll just kind of get these words going in our hearts and our minds as we, before we go to the message. So let's read together. Ready? God is our refuge and strength and an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall, God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You may be seated. It was not so very long ago that our culture walked away from the story that had created it and had sustained it. And our culture began to choose a much darker story, a much darker narrative. See, our culture, our whole American experiment was built upon the idea of a creator God who created a good world and who chose to restore and repair that world when it became infected with evil. A story that has a happy beginning and a happy ending a story about God joining us in the middle when things get messy and confused to help use us and work through us to repair this world and repair his creation. A way that we often talk about that in our church here is of to think of the letter U and how the letter U starts up here and ends up here. And so as it goes down into the lower part where things aren't working the way they should, we know that it's going to come back up where it needs to be. If you look at the optimism and the excitement and the sense of mission and purpose that people had uh, when they came to this country uh, before it even was a country, uh, you know that they believed that God was the foundation of, what they, what, of everything in, in our lives, help us know what was right, what was wrong, to help us find the right direction. And while they certainly made their mistakes and they certainly got some things terribly wrong, nonetheless, they understood that God would join them and would correct their path and bring things where they needed to be. Imagine being an American. Imagine living in Vermont or any part of our country uh, 150 years ago, just at, during the time of the Civil War. One of those dark, low places in the U. But the war was fought. For what purpose? To liberate people, to set them free, to make our society more just and true. And if you read about the people of that time, they all understood that what they were doing was part of a bigger story, a story with a good beginning and a good ending. But our culture has now largely abandoned this U-shaped story and chosen another story, one that's more like an upside-down U. Our culture's story now is one that begins with nothing and ends with nothing. There is no creator. The universe somehow spins out atoms, molecules, suns and galaxies, planets and people. But one day, what the universe gave, the universe will take away. Meanwhile, humans struggle against the forces of chaos and darkness to create a temporary illusion, 
of order and goodness. This is our world story. It's an upside down story. It's a story that you are exposed to every day. A story that is taken for granted throughout the major institutions of our society. It's a story in which there is no such thing as right and wrong in any absolute sense. It's just what we happen to think or what we happen to feel. Well, or it happens to be what people in charge tell us is right and tell us is wrong. But if you actually dig any deeper and say, but why? How do you know that that is right or wrong? Nobody has an answer because there is no, no God who controls the story, who's creating the story. And so what we do is we, we emerge from nothing. We assign meaning to ourselves to make ourselves feel important and powerful. But lurking behind the curtain all the time is this reality that this story eventually just goes back to nothing. That's the story of the world that we live in. Actually, people have been living that story for a very long, long time. You can go back throughout all of recorded history and you can find that peoples have struggled against the chaos and the problems and the trouble and the unpredictability of this world. And back in an earlier time, they would try to figure out those unseen forces, the gods or the goddesses or the demons or the angels or whatever, and try to find ways to appease them and get on their good side or at least keep them from punishing them. But if you dug a little deeper into their story, basically it was the same thing as the modern story. Thing we start with nothing, we end with nothing. As the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Nothing really has any purpose. And it's against this backdrop that the writer of Psalm 46 proclaims a totally different story, God's story. He doesn't shy away from troubles and problems and chaos, but he challenges us to walk away from that dark, upside-down story of our world and to dare to believe that the God who created us cares for us still and will repair his world. The song begins with a bold declaration. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present, easy to find, help in trouble. Take those little words apart and listen to what it's saying. First of all, yes, there will be trouble in this world. Anybody notice that over the last week? Did everything go perfectly? Did all of you, you know, no, obviously we look and an unseen bill came in and a problem came up in this relationship or that relationship and the news wasn't all good. You know, basically it's been said that they put bad news on, you know, at the at evening news so they can sell you things that make you feel good in between. The commercials are your relief. The commercials are the good news. The other stuff is just sort of the backdrop. But our world is filled with plenty of ammunition for that kind of a strategy. It's a broken world. But this song says that God is greater th than the trouble, and he's right here, easy to find if we want to look for him, right in the middle of the mess. The chaos from which God created this world can never unseat him or destroy his people. And to make that point, the writer paints a picture for us in the next couple of verses of what has to be, even to this day, one of the most horrifying examples of a world going crazy. Look with me at verse uh, 2 and 3. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. On July 9th, 1958, the largest tsunami ever recorded raged through Latoya Bay in southern Alaska. It was at 10.15 at night that an 8.3 uh, earthquake struck that area, causing a massive landslide on the side of a mountain at the end of this bay. Some 30 million cubic meters of rock and ice slid thousands of feet down the face of the mountain and into the bay. And the landslide, the earthquake and the mountain breaking down and falling into the water created this enormous tsunami called a mega tsunami, which rose to a height of 1,720 feet, way higher than the Empire State Building. I mean, beyond imagination, the water, if you see the next picture here, it just, the mountain slid down and the water then just went up and over the side of the, of the next mountain across the bay. Literally, the earth gave way. Literally, 
a mountain or big portion of it fell into the heart of the sea. You can imagine that the waters foamed and roared uh, if they could create a wave that would rush right up the other side of a mountain. To this very day, 50 years later, uh, people go into that bay and they can look and see where the big trees are and the little trees are because when that wave was finished, it took everything away. Now, you and I have those kinds of things happen in our life. They happen to our friends. Or they happen to our parents. They happen to our kids. They happen to us. Things that give way where nothing was supposed to give way. Things that we took for granted all of a sudden aren't there for us. I have a very dear friend, uh, Denise Rainville, who was uh, a member of our church back when Suzanne and I first came here with our family. She had a, a young family. He, Rob was on the board. And uh, you can imagine as a small church, we were all in our late 20s or early 30s. I was sort of a very close group. Everybody's kids knew everybody. We were, we were all in this together. They went on into the ministry. Rob became a pastor, pastoring down in Rutland. And uh, last Sunday, uh, at this time, she was having a stent put in because she'd had a heart attack Saturday night. She's a healthy lady. She's thin. She exercises. She competes with other people for the treadmill every time they go to a, one of the uh, Assembly of God events that happens at a hotel over in Portland. Uh, she is a picture of health. And in fact, when she came to the hospital, they were, the doctors and nurses were struggling to figure out what could be wrong with her because she didn't look like a candidate for a heart attack. But that's what she had. And now she's recovering. She has her stent. But imagine what's going on in her mind right now because her whole world was rocked, as it is whenever any of us have a major health issue, something that is you know, bigger than the splinter or the common cold. And we realize this may be the new reality. This is going to be going on in my life now. Where did this come from? It's, we say it rocks our world, and that's exactly what it did for her. But the same thing happens in, in people's lives, whether it's in their relationships or whether it's in their finances or whether it's uh, even in terms of hearing God speak to them and say, I want you to step out and do a new thing. And it shakes up your world. The earth can feel like it's giving way. and Even the mountains that we count on feel like they're just going to fall into the sea and stir everything up. So where do you go when everything lets loose and the trouble comes? Well, the psalm writer responds that while the world we live in can be chaotic and threatening, God is here for us. Look with me at verses 4 and 7. He says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You see, what this writer is saying is that when things go from good to bad, when our story goes down in that you, God isn't way off in the distance. God isn't just sitting back saying, well, I wonder if they'll figure it out. This isn't just some sort of test to see whether we, we pass or we fail, and too bad if you get it wrong. God is right there at the bottom of that you. Yes, he started this world on its course. He started you on your course and, and me on mine. But he is also right here in the place where everything seems to be coming apart. There's a river. Where is that river? right in that place where it seems like we're going to be swept away by the raging waters, God creates a stream that gives life. A stream that makes glad the city of God. And see, it says the holy place where the Most High dwells. Yes, we think of God as being far away in heaven, but this verse says, but he's right here, right where you are. Look at it, it's over again. God is within her, she will not fall. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God makes a safe place for us when the trouble comes. A place of refuge, a place of strength. His city is our city. His fortress is our fortress. It cannot fall. And this is an amazing picture of God. If you were to look at the religions of that time when the Bible was being written, that was not the way they saw the gods. The gods were basically meaner and pow more powerful versions of humans. So if a human king could be unpredictable, the gods even more so. 
If a human king or queen could be bloodthirsty, the gods even more so. Nowhere in the pagan world do you find the kind of love and forgiveness and compassion that the Jewish people always talk about when they talk about their God and our God. And this psalm writer is saying, in the middle of your problem, God is already there. He's already built that fortress. We all experience the chaos and the evil of this world. In this psalm, it comes from two places. He talks about the natural world going crazy, being unpredictable, being dangerous, the earthquake and the storm and so on. The uproar of the nations speaks to what humans do to each other, doesn't it? Whether it be on the, on the world stage, as we even see to this day with, with the caliphate of the, the Islamic State running rampant all over half of Syria and half of Iraq, or whether it be uh, in, the, in the Ukraine where well, we just wonder what the Russians are going to do next, or whether it be North Korea, or whether it be perhaps dozens of other places. May even be just in our own little neighborhood, trying to get along with each other and not knowing how other people are going to respond. Sometimes the chaos is right here, isn't it? Sometimes the biggest danger we have, probably most of the time, the biggest danger we have is that we get swept up in all the craziness and we lose our way. And then the people that are counting on us and the lives that depend upon us are now exposed to the chaos because we've bought into it, forgotten who we are. We're people on God's, in God's story. And the Lord has offered us a place of safety. When our world gets shaken to its very core, our story tells us God has a fortress, God has a city, God has a calm stream right there in the middle of that mess. And folks, if you get anything out of this message, what I want to get through to you is that when you're in the mess, when you're in the problem, when it feels overwhelming and you can't see a way up, that's where God is. God lives in the mess with you. God is not a neat freak. He's not afraid to be there where you are. When we look at the story of Jesus, that's what the story is all about. Read the Gospels over and over again, and you'll find that they, have, they begin with everything the way it ought to be, and they end with everything the way it ought to be. But the climax of the story is at the very bottom of that you, where the human race has unleashed its most horrible behaviors upon this one good person, Jesus. And the turning point, which goes from the downward spiral of sin and destruction back to eternal life, is the cross. Right there, God himself says, I'll take my stand in the mess. Jesus' last words on the cross were simply, it is finished. It's all done. No longer do human beings have to keep living in that mess, descending deeper and deeper and deeper into the confusion and brokenness of this world. It's done. We turn the corner. We're heading back up. And with his resurrection, as he rose from the dead and came out of that tomb, he announced, death itself has been defeated. And now people, one by one, like you and me, can choose to live that story, can choose to follow him. The key is to know how to come to that place of safety. And you know, it all comes down in one way to which story you choose to live. And you say, what do you mean, choose a story? We all choose a story. We, we live stories, and we choose a story every day. Every day, we get up, and we go into our, into our, our work, or we in, in relate with our family. We're telling ourselves a story. We're, telling, we're listening to the stories of other people. We're deciding whether this is going to be one of those things where I try to make it work, but then eventually I know it's going to fail, or whether I'm on God's path. And even though things are hard, or maybe even going to get harder, that's not the end of the story. Remember, God never wrote a story that turns out bad. God is not the writer of tragedies. He writes the story of your victory and mine. We're called overcomers because there is stuff to overcome. There are problems that need to be solved. We have broken areas in our lives that need to be healed. We have sins that need to be forgiven. But he's put all of that in place so that we come out of that low place. We don't stay there. 
God isn't done with you. Do you know how I know God isn't done with you? You're breathing. If you're breathing, God isn't finished with you. You know how we know when God is completely finished with somebody when their work on this, in, on this planet is done? He brings them home. We're all here. He has work for us to do. And that means he has a path of victory for each and every one of us. So, having given us this picture of this fortress and, and of, of this place of safety, the, the songwriter says, now come and see what the Lord has done. Come and take a look at how this works. I recently watched a documentary on World War II. It told the story of how the Nazis attempted to build what they called the Atlantic Wall to keep all invaders out from attacking any part of Europe. Now, this wall went all the way from the very top of Norway down the whole Norwegian coast, all the way across Western Europe, France, right to the Spanish border. And it was built with all sorts of bunkers and gun emplacements and various other types of devices to keep people out. Hundreds of thousands of people manning this thing. And I, watching the documentary reminded me of many years ago when I was there with my family in France and my daughter, my oldest daughter and I walked up the top of a long hill, a cliff, and found one of these bunkers. I mean, we just followed this path and there we were and all of a sudden we were poking around inside this bunker looking out the little slits at the beach and so on. That had been part of this Long Atlantic Wall. On June the 6th of 1944, Allied forces put this wall to the test. They stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day. And the amazing thing is that this wall, which took years and years to build, stretched 3,000 miles, was manned by hundreds of thousands, if not more, of soldiers. The wall failed within a couple of hours. Now all that remains are crumbling concrete ruins, many of them covered with graffiti. And this formidable wall, this endless line of fortresses, is now regularly invaded by tourists and picnickers. Now the writer of Psalm 46 would have understood that fate very well because he says this is what God does to the forces that would destroy his world. Verses 8 and 9, he says, Come and see what the Lord has done. Take a look at what the Creator does with things that, cr that destroy his creation. The desolations he's brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. You see, this is what God does. God always causes the story to take the turn. And things that would destroy his world, God allows to be destroyed. You read the story of World War II and for all of the bunkers and all of the gun emplacements and all of the harsh things that the Nazis did, they made some pretty big mistakes. Their ruler, their leader, Adolf Hitler, was a crazy man and eventually his craziness caught up with him. And some of those mistakes opened the door for American and Canadian and British soldiers to come, uh, come ashore on D-Day and not meet the resistance they could have met. You see, God lets evil destroy itself. And you will see in your own life, if you find his place of safety, most of the things you thought were, were going to come against you and destroy you are going to evaporate before they even have a chance to come about. God lets evil destroy itself. He breaks those things down. God brings back peace. I'm telling you, if you had been standing on that place where my daughter and I were uh, in 1943, you would have thought nobody could ever, nobody could ever displace this enemy. They've got too many guns and too many bunkers and too many tanks and too many this and too many that. In three hours' time, American soldiers had broken that wall and now it was just a matter of how fast the Germans could get out of France. Just like that. God can do the same thing and will do the same thing in our lives if we find his place of safety. At the end of the song, after having been told, A, God's our strength, B, even though the world seems to be coming apart, he creates a place of safety, C, look at what he's done, then God himself speaks. He sort of has the last word in this song. Verse 10, the writer says, He says... Be still and know that I am God. 
I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Think of it. Right there in the middle of earthquakes and tsunamis, politics and warfare, God is present and he's talking to us. He's not just saying, go figure it out. He's not just saying, well, I'm playing hide and seek with you, and you know, if you really get it just right, you might, might find me for a second in your life. He is speaking right into the midst of that. And what does he say? He says, be still and know that I am God. That term, be still, means to relax, to let go, to just stand down. You know how it is when trouble comes, we tend to tense up. I know when, when I'm stressed, eventually, I'm going to the chiropractor because my lower back just tightens up. I don't know how it does it, why it does it. It seems to know on its own that it's time to lock me down because something's going on. When I'm healthy, I can lift stuff I shouldn't be looking at. When I'm tense, I can put my back out by picking up a pencil. And probably you have things in your life that (laughs) let you know when you're under stress. Fight or flight. But God is saying in that time when you feel threatened, Come into my city. Come into my fortress. Come to me. Look at what I do. And then stand down. Relax and remember who I am. I have this under control. I'm going to be exalted both in the people realm and in the natural realm. Stick with me. When things go wrong, find the fortress. See, which story are you going to live? Are you going to live the story, I got to figure this out all by myself? I don't know where I came from. I don't know where I'm going. But I know right now I've got this urge to somehow make it financially or keep this relationship going or I I, I want to try to be a better person but it's all up to me and when it doesn't work I've got nothing to fall back on. Is that your story? I love the way Pastor Mike used to put it. How's that working for you? How's that story working for you? Because I can promise you this. Life is too tough for any story we come up with on our own. It's too tough. It's too unpredictable. You're going to choose God's story. God's story takes you into his fortress, not as an escape, not as a bailout, but as a place of strength and safety from which you can then go out and win the victory that only God can bring you. Choose God's story. You're going to have a chance to do this this week and throughout the rest of this year. Things are going to happen in your life and you're going to have to decide Am I walking my story or am I walking God's story? The beautiful thing about your Bible is that it tells God's story over and over and over and over again. Every psalm tells this story. Every story we read reinforces this story. A good God who's going to see us through the tough things to a good result. And I want to challenge you to make that your story. That's what I work on every day is when I look at things in my life and the stories of people that come to me and we talk and we pray together, it's always, Lord, you said you're here. You said you're present. You're talking to us and saying, be still and know that I am God. I'll fix it. And I want to encourage you to make that your story. Don't give in to the phony stories of this world. They don't work out. There, most of them are told simply so somebody can get something for a short period of time. God's story is so that you can have his life and fullness forever and ever. Let's bow our heads together. And I'm going to ask your prayer folks to come down, uh, those that are here with us, band to come on up. Thank you. Lord, you know we need to know your story. We need to track your story instead of making up our own We need to know what it means to be still, to rest, to relax, and know that you are God and that you're right here with us. We need to hear your voice. A few weeks ago, we talked about the good shepherd, and that's what the shepherd does, even in the darkest time. And Lord, in the good times, help us remember that those blessings come from you. We didn't earn them. We didn't create them that they are part of your new life that you're pouring into us. Help us find that river that makes glad the city of God. Lord, that living water that is your gift that Jesus promised that it would become a stream even flowing out of us ourselves. 
people around us that are thirsty will be able to drink from you and find your story for themselves. And we thank you, Lord. And I pray for people in this room right now that you would talk to them and you would say what they need to hear. That, Lord, they would see the next step in the life journey that they're taking right now. And Lord, it would come out of your story, not theirs. In Jesus' name, amen.